I see you here. I wanted to talk about guilt today and how useless of an emotion it is. Okay, so this is a good one. So, what up, what up? I'm back at it with another video. Today's video, I'm going to be reviewing the film The Social Dilemma, which is courtesy of Netflix. It's a Netflix original docudrama hybrid that explores the dangerous human impact of social media with tech experts sounding the alarm on their own creations. So first up, I wanna talk about the film's impact. Everybody I know has been talking about this film. They've been recommending it to me to watch. And a lot of people actually have been doing the opposite. Like, oh no, don't watch it, it's too much. And so I kind of knew that like, oh, this is something that maybe I wanna watch to gain my own perspective on since people seem to have such strong reactions toward it. So the film is directed by Jeff Orlowski. Jeff Orlowski is also one of the writers, as is Vicky Curtis and Davis Coomb. I guess some of my initial thoughts about having seen the film is that I really did not like it, but at the same time, I do see why people think that everybody should watch it. I will get into more of that as we go along as to why I did not like it and also the contradiction of why, even though I didn't like it, I think that many people should see it or be aware of some of the major themes in it. So the film opens with a shot of a quote by Sophocles, nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. That quote is seen in the foreground and in the background there are these like little things they kind of look like keys on a keyboard at first to me but they look slightly different and I'm just kind of like trying to figure out what is this exactly and later on in the film we figure out that it, it they're actually cells and like cell blocks and within all of those little like cell blocks that look like keys are sort of all of us and one of the things about social media what has happened is that we are no longer the consumers but we are actually the product and the consumers are actually corporations, advertisers who pay a lot of money to these social media entities to advertise to us. And they do it so well that we don't even realize that we are being exposed to different advertising. We are exposed to different sort of ideas. And over time, what will happen is that it's like a gradual change in us, which has enormous impact and enormous implications. And so it's like one of those business models that's in it for like the long haul instead of like a short maybe like 13 week campaign or short six week campaign this is like over the course of 40 50 60 years of someone's life that subtle or not so subtle advertising will have a direct impact on what we do what we think what we say and who we are one of the very early ideas presented to us in the social dilemma is that these things that you create these social media models that you create, they wind up having a life of their own. You make them and you have a particular intent or intention and then you put it out into the world and they take on a life of their own. Much like a sort of virus or even like a plant, things just sort of like germinate and just keep building on top of each other and they morph into something unrecognizable sometimes. So there are some great themes in this film. For example, technology's ability to bring out the worst in humanity and the worst in humanity being this existential threat that is the real enemy. It brings up issues of more of an inability to focus on real issues that impacts people's material well-being. How society at this point is really unable to heal itself and it's leading to a lot of de-evolution in certain regards. Apathy, dehumanization, and trying to wake up from the matrix when you don't know you're inside the matrix. They even have clips from the film The Truman Show in it and I thought that that was like a really great parallel and they talked about how in The Truman Show, Jim Carrey's character was the focus of the film. However, in our real world, all of us are in The Truman Show. All of us are having our perspectives fabricated and manipulated and are also constantly being surveilled. Now there were some tips toward the end of the film about how to begin to unplug, right? So one of the tips was not bringing your phone or devices into the bedroom, especially after a certain time of day. Let's say you go to bed at 10 p.m. So you don't wanna bring your phone into your bedroom starting at maybe like 8 p.m. So that you are creating these boundaries between where you sleep and relax and your phone and being plugged in. 
Another one was turn off all your notifications for all of your social media. Another one was use the search engine Quant instead of Google because Quant does not track your search history. It turn off your GPS. Don't tag places that you go to eat or that you're at. Delete social media apps off of your phone. Never choose recommended videos on YouTube when you're watching. Always go to the search bar and just look up whatever you're looking for because that's one little way of like fighting against the machine. There are Chrome extensions that can remove recommendations. Make sure you fact check and see if the news that you're getting is from a reliable source. Your clicks, your likes are votes on what you want to be presented with in the future. So if you look at it from that point of view, then it can give you a bit more perspective. And lastly, put yourself on a time budget. Many phones come with this thing where you can make yourself log out of apps once you've hit your daily limit of time for using it. It definitely recommends that you use these time budgets and you use these things and actually stick to them. So for the closing shot, we have Tristan Harris, who is sort of like our narrator throughout the entire documentary drama hybrid. And he asserts that we need to change the entire thing. And he's asked, do you think we can? Do you think we're going to get there? And he says, we have to. And his disposition and the way he says it is quite grim. It's quite unsettling. He's also in this blue room where you can see light coming through these like windows in the in behind him. It's very like somber. It's very like chilling. And even when it comes to like the color grading, he looks quite pale. And I think all of this is intentional. I think that the creators of this were really going for this person, our presenter, looking very sort of like washed out and grim, almost lifeless in a way. Because in the beginning of the film, the way that he's color corrected and graded is like slightly different and progressive we see really the color fade out of his face. So in terms of enjoyability, I would give this film a two out of five. I do not find it very enjoyable whatsoever. I think it is quite dark, it is quite grim, but at the same time, this information is very important to be presented with. And awareness is a big thing. When you begin to become aware about an issue, you can start to make changes. You can start to be conscious of the things that you're doing. And now when it comes to rating overall, I really struggled with the rating. I really was between rating it a two. That was like my initial reaction to seeing the film and a three. I'm kind of in between a two and a three, but now in, in hindsight, I feel like I'm leaning more toward a three only because this information is so important. And I, I do think that more people should be aware of these things. However, I do see some glaring problems with this film that were not even really brought to the forefront. So now this is going to get into the critique portion. Fun, yay. I think the film has a serious unwillingness to examine whiteness and white supremacy and how that provided the conditions necessary to create social media in the first place. How it provided the access, yet exclusion. So there are people in this film who talk about working in tech in Silicon Valley, being in a room full of like 30 white men who are in their 20s, looked at as some of the most skilled designers or skilled hackers or skilled people in the tech world. That is a glaring problem, first of all. When you talk about white supremacy, there is an insidiousness, there is an aspect that just completely goes unseen and you really see that in the film. Whiteness is never implicated. White supremacy is never implicated. There are sections where they sort of talk about capitalism or they allude to like oh capitalism is what created these problems or what makes it so that this machine is going to just keep going. It's relatively shallow. The analysis from this docudrama is relatively shallow. Like the lowest point it goes is a place where it's like oh yeah capitalism is like kind of bad and then it comes right back up and it just kind of talks about like all of the problems that social media is causing and it never gets to the root of the issue. When your analysis lacks depth, even if this one thing is conquered, even if social media is destroyed or is 
repurposed, even if regulations are put in place toward these gigantic corporations, that's not getting to the root of the issue. It was really frustrating to watch this film because I walked away from this film feeling like this was a reform and apology tour rather than a call for shutting this completely down because we know that it is bringing out the worst in humanity. We know that we are being manipulated by machines. We know that capitalism is a soul crunching evil that requires death, that requires black death. Capitalism requires racism to function. It requires people at the bottom having nothing and doing all the work and people at the top getting to experience the fruits of that labor at the bottom. It requires dehumanization of white people. It requires the dehumanization of black people. It requires the dehumanization of everybody, of all races. Someone says at the end of the film, these machines won't turn around until there is massive public pressure. And that is one of the sort of ingenious things about white supremacy. It will create a problem problem and it will then say, oh, but it's up to you to fix it. We want to hear from you. Tell us what you think will fix this problem that we created. And we're not going to take the blame. We're not going to take responsibility. There's a small section in it when we see Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook on trial at the U.S. Senate. He and other people who have been brought there are asked, who do you think is responsible for this? What do you think is responsible for this? And almost everybody defaults to saying, oh, either it's these gigantic corporations that are responsible for this, or it's the users that are responsible for this. And everybody kind of skirts around taking responsibility, everybody in the film. And they put that responsibility back onto us, back onto the users. So you created this world where it's necessary to have social media platforms in a multitude of career fields. I am an actor and I'm also a writer. And as an actor and a writer, I have to have social media. And not only do I have to have social media, I have to have a strong social media following. This is not just exclusive to acting and writing. It is a part of our lives, even in industries where you are not required to have a social media. They expect you to know certain current events or certain things that happen on social media. And if you're not a part of that, then uh, I, just, I just can't relate to this person. Yeah, I don't think they're a right fit for this place. They're not good for the culture here. So you've made it a part, an integral part of the fabric of society, at least in major American cities. And now you are making it our responsibility responsibility to dictate how often we use it or what we use it for or be aware of the dangers or whatever. That is one of the real, real weaknesses. That is one of the real problems and contradictions of this film. A lot of the people responsible for this problem are the ones making this film and are the ones who are propped up as the good guys, our thought leaders, or are helping us see the dangers of these things. And so they, they, they meant well, they have good intentions, they meant well, they meant for it to go like this, but you know, human nature is just so chaotic. The call is coming from inside the house. What I will say is that until white people globally and specifically in America have a serious sit down with each other and with themselves and really get to the root and examine white supremacy, they need to do the reading, they need to do the work. And this is not overnight work, but at the same time, these problems require overnight solutions. So while y'all are over there working and doing that internal work to figure out what's going on, this system needs to be replaced because this is life or death. This has been urgent for a long time. It has always been like this. And that's what black people have been saying for decades, for hundreds of years. I don't think that I can say it any better. There are documentaries, there are books on this that black feminists have written, that people from the Black Panther Party have written about. There are indigenous folks that have been talking about this since the beginning of American settlement. And this is a consequence of all of that. This is what has been said for forever. And the documentary is so frustrating because it's literally, to me, it's right there. Like it's right there. And it's just a complete unwillingness to see, a complete disregard for race and how race impacts so much of what is possible when it comes to technology and human advancement. It's really mind numbing because these people are considered some of the most brilliant minds or strongest minds in terms of tech or whatever, but I find them to be quite 
I don't have a word. And that's part of what is so sort of ingenious about whiteness as well. It will present itself as though, oh, I'm just a well-meaning white guy. I'm just a well-meaning white woman and I didn't mean anything bad. I just did this thing. But that's not really the truth. They knew that they were crossing these boundaries when they developed these systems. They knew that they were going to the depths of human psychology and preying on a weakness and humanity. They know that humans need to feel connected to other people. They know that we need to feel validated. And it gets into these dark parts of humanity. It gets into the exploitation of humanity, into the exploitation of human weakness and human community. These are extraordinarily violent, perverted, predatory things. And and another one of my issues and frustrations with this film is that there are no serious repercussions for any of the people who created this technology and this formula. They actually get to go on this apology tour and charge universities to hear them speak. They get to write about these problems that they created and make more money. They get to be the heroes. They get to write the stories. They get to write the documentaries and star in them. And they get to be seen as geniuses when they have created some of the worst, most vile, boundary crossing things in all of humanity. They could begin to atone for what they've done by completely distributing their wealth to the most vulnerable people in society and toward mental health facilities and research specifically geared toward technology and social media's effects on the brain, on social interactions, on, on material well-being. If they are really serious about atoning for what they've done, if they have all of this guilt and like, oh my God, what did I do? I didn't, I didn't mean anything. I didn't, I'm not, a, I'm not a bad person. If you really believe that you're not a bad person, you can begin to atone by literally distributing your wealth to the aforementioned. So to round up this video, I just want to read some quotes from the film that really stuck with me. It's the gradual, slight, imperceptible change in your own behavior and perception that is the product. How much time can we get you to spend? How much of your life can we get you to give to us? If you're not paying for the product, then you are the product. As humans, we've almost lost control of these systems because they're controlling the information that we see. They're controlling us more than we're controlling them. When you look at the world around you, it feels like the world has gone crazy. You have to ask yourself, is this normal or have we fallen under some kind of spell? Algorithms are opinions embedded in code. Algorithms are not objective. They are optimized to some definition of success, usually profit, commercial interest. We in the tech industry have created the tools to destabilize and erode the fabric of society in every country, all at once, everywhere. All this data that we're pouring out all the time is being fed into these systems that have almost no human supervision and that are making better predictions about what we're going to do and who we are. Are we pouring it out? Or was it designed to be stolen? And was it built to be inherently predatory? This market should be outlawed because they have inevitable, destructible consequences. We're no longer listening to one another. We need to have some shared understanding of what reality is. Otherwise, we aren't a country. Another one of my frustrations with this film is that it is so liberal and I don't mean that in a good way. There are people who are my enemies. There are people who wish me harm. There are people who do not believe I deserve respect or rights or humanity. I don't want to prove to them that I'm human. Now, liberals will come along and they'll be like, oh, no, wait, let's be fair. Let's be objective. Let's hear both sides and try to come to a common ground. There's something about that that is so dangerous because it says that both sides just have a disagreement that they that just needs to be worked out. And if we just work this small disagreement out, then surely, surely we can all hold hands and, and be one big nation again. That really slows down any chance of revolution. That slows down truly addressing people's material needs on a day-to-day -day basis. What are we even talking about? And that is the DNA of this film. It is all about, oh, well, we just don't understand each other. We just need to listen to the other side. And even in the tips that I gave at the beginning of this video, it comes from this place of, okay, Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Take individual responsibility. Here's what you can do as a person. I resent that so much because y'all sat in a room and picked apart what makes human beings tick. Y'all picked apart human psychology. Y'all went into the core 
and the depths and the wounds of humanity and exploited those things and created social media. So it is so incredibly ridiculous and violent to now say, oh, it's up to you. You are what it takes. You, the individual, it is your fault. It is your responsibility to manage these things. There's also a real failure in terms of diversity of voice in this film. We don't really get to sit down with these giant corporations and really hear from their own mouth them talk about what the work culture is like in their offices and what they expect and what they demand and who they hire and who gets promoted and who gets fired. There's also no perspective from Black organizers. Maybe do use these apps for organizing tools, but also understand the brunt of surveillance and how as a Black person, as, as a Black LGBT person who is poor, you will face things that you cannot even imagine. So I did have a lot of problems with this film, as you can obviously see. And what I would encourage every single viewer watching this is to go deeper. Don't just stop at, oh, capitalism. Yeah, it's like kind of bad, even though, yeah, it has created certain good things in my life and certain luxuries. Yeah, it's kind of bad. Please go deeper. Go deeper beyond representation politics and we need representation. It's deeper than that. White supremacy is not just about white people. Go deeper. So anyway, that is my review of The Social Dilemma. Please let me know what you think in the comment section below. Leave me some hearts. And if you would like to support me materially, my cash app information, my Venmo is right down below. You can buy me a cup of coffee anywhere from $2 to $5. I would really appreciate it. And let me know what you think of this review. Let me know what you think of these concepts, especially of surveillance. Let me know if there are any other films you want me to review or any other TV shows you want me to review that are kind of in my alley of like mental health, mental wellness. And and I will see you again next time. Peace.